Did it do it? It shows streaming. Okay. Oh, there it goes. Awesome. And we're magically live on the internet. If you were able to tune in, uh, you could see that, uh, that we're just double checking everything. Look at John go. <laughs> we should be back over. Well, welcome everyone to the first, uh, and, and well, not the first of the year, but the second of the year, SeattleMobile.net uh, developers user group. I'm super excited because this is the first time that we're actually um, co-hosting it over here with the .NET uh, Foundation uh, via the .NET uh, Virtual User Group, uh, which is super exciting. Uh, so uh, I'm James Montemagna. You can see me up in the little corner over there. Hey, everyone, there's me, uh, which is great. And um, <laughs> well, that's funny. Now you can see everyone in this chat message. So now I can tell John if he's listening not to chat in the chat message. It's the first time we're actually doing this, so it's actually really exciting. Uh, where before we had to host everything completely separately, uh, and now it's a very simple, like kind of Azure VM magical Skype window back and forth. Uh, so it's quite awesome. Uh, I'm really excited because um, I have YouTube up over here, so you can feel free to ask questions throughout the entirety uh, of the session, uh, chat throughout, um, as well as we're discussing different things uh, throughout the the session. Uh, today, I'm going to be giving a session, so now I'm hosting the Seattle Mobile Dot User Group. I blame it because Frank uh, is usually here with me, uh, but he is off uh, doing uh, awesome things. Uh, but I'll be giving a talk on this app that I built recently called Island Tracker. It uses uh, Xamarin, Azure Functions, Table Storage, and a whole lot more. Uh, and how I built it, my motivation behind it, and some of the awesome library and component stuff that I put together for it. Like I said, this is the first uh, meetup um, hosted by the .NET Virtual User Group. So if you're already a member of the Seattle Mobile.net User Group, Mobile .NET User Group, and you're uh, used to meeting in the Reactor and Redmond, uh, welcome back, uh, obviously. Uh, and uh, if you're joining from anywhere around the world, uh, not on Seattle time, a welcome as well. Uh, and I wanted to put this slide in here because um, it's uh, a growing uh, brand new virtual user group from the Fo .NET Foundation. And the whole goal of the .NET Virtual User Group is to help to support .NET user groups um, while everyone is in this virtual um, um, transition currently. So as user groups um, and individuals are at home more, um, you can't meet up. So there are some user groups that have tried different things back and forth. And the .NET Foundation kind of came together working with a bunch of people on GitHub uh, in the, the GitHub discussion uh, to figure out, hey, how do how do how does the .NET Foundation support .NET user groups? Well, we can handle doing everything live, handle the infrastructure, and promote the user groups too. So the the user group was actually hosted um, and promoted on both the Seattle Mobile .NET user group and the .NET Virtual user group. And the whole goal is to grow the .NET Virtual user groups. Um, and enable anyone to, to join in on the user group calls, uh, which I think is super duper fun. Uh, so if you're looking uh, to, to find .NET uh, virtual user groups, because maybe your local one uh, isn't going, maybe reach out to the, to the user group leader and let them know. Um, or um, you know, just sign up and, and on the meetup page, and they'll be more listed as more uh, .NET user groups. I have some virtual meetups uh, or um, um, join on to, to be hosted by the .NET Virtual User Group. So it's super duper awesome. Now, as most of the user groups we always start off with, we start off with some um, who we are and what we do. Uh, so I'm James Montemagna. I'm a program manager here at Microsoft. Um, and uh, I help co-host the Seattle Mobile .NET User Group, usually in Redmond, my good buddy Frank Kruger, who's an independent .NET developer. We focus on .NET development, C Sharp, F Sharp, iOS, Android, Mac development, Windows development, and even game development with Unity. So we talk about all things uh, in the world of .NET, heavily uh, mobile with Xamarin, but not always. Uh, and it's fun to, to see uh, the comments come in here. Jonathan Bachelor in the chat says it's awesome to see, be able to attend more and more user groups. And feel free to tweet out too and let everyone know. Um, so really excited about that. Now, usually at the um, user groups, I always like to do some announcements uh, from the last month. So if you haven't maybe been keeping up to date or honestly, there's so much going on in the world of .NET, it's hard to keep up with everything. I uh, wanted to sort of share some of the build announcements in the world of mobile.net. So the first thing is that um, Xamarin Forms 4.6 shipped into stable 
and 4.7 is actually in um, pre-release right now. This is a super good update. Um, I'm shipping applications with this update. In fact, uh, some of them required some of the new things in here. Um, so some cool improvements here are um, a visual material updates. So bringing material design to iOS and Android and streamlining it there, which is awesome. Um, also some shell enhancements. So in the top right corner, you can see some more customization. It's all based on visual state manager. Really, really nice. There's a new radio button with radio button groupings that are going on. Uh, and also brand new expander controls, uh, which you can see on the bottom right down here, which is really cool. Uh, and also C sharp UI extensions. So if you're doing C sharp development that there, my favorite feature that I use very, very heavily, which I'll showcase as well, which is font embedding, uh, which we've always had the ability to do custom fonts. Um, but now you can do, um, simple cross platform fonts with a single line of code. So you no longer have to put them everywhere. So. Yeah, feel free, everyone in the chat, to shout out where you're from. We got Jonathan in San Diego and Steve in uh, Tennessee. It's very cool to have everyone here. I'm really appreciative of it. And it's cool, too, because all these videos will be archived, so you can always watch them later. Kind of an advantage of just streaming it right over to YouTube, which is great. Now, the other really awesome announcement. Um, I don't know why my thing isn't full screen. Why isn't this thing full screen? Let me see if I can figure out why. I don't know how to. How do I use this thing called PowerPoint? Oh, there we go. Perfect. Um, another exciting announcement uh, was with .NET 5 and .NET 6 next year, um, some awesome things that are coming for Xamarin developers and just desktop developers and mobile developers and just .NET developers. Um, uh, during the .NET 5 and .NET 6 session from Scott Hunter and Scott Hanselman, they announced .NET MAUI, um, which is the .NET multi-platform app UI. It is the evolution of Xamarin Forms. So you can think of the next generation of Xamarin Forms reimagined from the ground up, built on top of .NET 5 and .NET 6, um, which is really, really cool. Uh, it features uh, um, a brand new uh, project system and single code base system uh, to help developers be more productive. It's, of course, cross-platform with native UI, has a new underlying architecture to um, simplify renderers and make it really easy to extend it to other backends or front ends, if you will, such as like a Skia backend um, there. It also is first class support for mobile and desktop. So iOS, Android, Windows, and Mac, first class support. And like I said, it's an evolution of Xamarin Forms. It's going to target .NET 6. So it's a ways off, but it's open source already. So you can take a look at the first steps and all of the great um, work that the team is doing and are really open to proposals, not only in the um, code base of how you build applications, uh, but also um, with um, the tooling as well. And I'll talk about some of the tooling stuff here too, which is cool. And um, that's because while Xamarin and Xamarin Forms developers have been used to XAML and MVVM, that'll still be here in .NET MAUI, um, but the team is also looking at adding an MVU code first approach. So model view update, it's a little bit different, but it enables C sharp development actually, actually in from inside of VS code as well. Um, first class support to easily create user interfaces with hot reload built in. So here you can see from David and Maddie's session, uh, David is changing some of the text here in a label that says I will run X miles instead of lines this month, and you can increment it. So the entire state is saved. Um, there's simplified naming and um, ways of building up your UI. So there's like a, a button with a rounded border with a frame around it, um, you know, with different background colors. And um, this is sort of this body that gets updated um, whenever, whenever your UI um, changes in, the, in in here. So it doesn't have to do a full redraw, it just does a diff into the kind of virtual DOM, if you will, but it's a native DOM in some way. That's what I'm going to bookmark that and just pen native DOM. Uh, but it's really cool. And you can just, again, run it right from VS Code or open in VS on Mac or VS uh, 2019 on Windows. And this is really great because file noon from the command line is easier than ever. Dot new, you know, um, Maui, and then boom, you're good to go. But also, um, the team is looking at how to simplify um, actually how you build it. So remember, I said single project. So now in the days of uh, Xamarin application, you have your .NET standard library, you have your iOS, Android, your Mac, your Windows, it gets unruly. So instead of having all of that, 
you'll just simply have one project with all of your dependencies. And this is really, really nice. Um, and in fact, and that's what you see on the top left here, you'll see resources, platforms, and all of your app code. And here I have just a XAML app. In the middle, you'll see the CS proj. Since it's going to be built on top of .NET 6 next fall, it'll be .NET 6, .NET 6, whatever, in, this, in our demo is .NET 5, and simple project structure for your entire application. And there'll be ways to get to like the info P list and Android stuff, all that stuff is really cool. And then also, since it's a single project, you can easily deploy to any of your targets. So whether you want to go to desktop, Android emulator, Windows, if you're on a Mac, obviously your Mac, and you can go there. So really, really nice, super streamlined um, there. On the bottom part, I'm really excited about too, and what the team showed off, uh, David and also Hunter in his session, is streamlining resources and images and cross-platform stuff. So for example, here in resources, you see that there's fonts. You just put all of your font awesome fonts in there, and then your images, all of your images. Your fonts will be embedded fonts that work immediately across your entire application. And your images will be automatically resized to at 1x, at 2x, at 3x, and the appropriate Android variations too at compile time. And it'll cache them so you only have to do it once. It's very cool. Now, everything in here will just be shared platform, cross-platform code. But also, there's the ability to add platform code. Now, you could, of course, add an Android library and an iOS library and all this stuff. Or you could just put your platform code in the platform folder. So for example, here, maybe you needed to access the Bluetooth adapter. You just simply add a C-sharp file or F-sharp file into your platform code right there, and then boom, done. You're good to go. And it'll automatically know that it's Android stuff right there, iOS stuff, and then you can register it with dependency services and everything like that. But it's all going to work um, how you sort of would expect it to work, which is really, really cool. I really love it. And that was one of the big announcements. I encourage you to check out the blog down there. Take a screenshot of that real quick. Or just scrub back, I guess, in YouTube. You can scrub backwards in there and go from there. And that's it. That's sort of my news, my updates I have. I don't know if anyone has any questions in the chat. I can definitely go through and uh, uh, answer them. So feel free to ask questions in the chat. You know, David says he's excited for Donna Maui. Uh, uh, Jonathan says hello. A um, few San Diegans in here. I like that. That was really cool. And Jay's in downtown Seattle. Hope you're safe and doing well down there. Hope everyone's doing safe um, as well during during uh, these times. Very cool. Well, if you have, have any questions, feel free to ask. I will transition over here and uh, into the main talk, which is me. So you have to hear me talk uh, even more. <laughs> so there's that. Uh, so let me go ahead and swap over into my other slide deck. Uh, that I have open. So let's go over there. Hey, there's me. Hey, everyone. How's it going? Whoa. That's cool. I should probably minimize that. Ah, and there's me. I got this Detective Pikachu over there. That's pretty cool. All the monkeys are right over there. That's pretty cool, too. Um, that's it. That's my home, home office currently. And this is microphone, in case you saw it right there. All right, cool. Let me minimize this. That's cool. Let's go and rearrange some stuff. Perfect. Cool. All right. Bum, 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 bum. Perfect. All right. So uh, what I have tonight um, is something that I've been working on uh, live uh, on my live stream on Twitch. I Twitch stream every Friday on um, on, tw on Twitch <laughs> on different topics in Xamarin and .NET and all sorts of stuff. Uh, and I've been building this application called Island Trackers for Animal Crossing, which is a Nintendo Switch game. You don't need to necessarily know too much about it, but I'll explain it a little bit as to why I care so much about turnips in general. <laughs> so there's that. Uh, if you're just coming in, I'm James Montemagno. I'm a principal lead program manager for .NET Community at Microsoft. And you can find me everywhere on the internet, GitHub, Twitter, and Twitch at James Montemagno. You can just search for my name on Google or Bing, and you will find me. Uh, pretty much everywhere possible. And I thought this would be a fun talk because uh, I spent a lot of time building it live, getting input from from people, collaborating uh, with people, watching the stream, um, and also it uses a lot of different things. It uses Xamarin, obviously, to build the application, Azure Functions, and Azure Table Storage as the back end, and a bunch of other cool um, services um, from Microsoft and third party as well. So I wanted to talk about 
the application, how I went about building it, answer questions along the way. I think there's maybe about a 30 second delay in the chat. So I'll keep looking at the chat, which I have over here. So feel free to ask questions or chat at all and go from there. And um, I want to kind of talk about some lessons learned too. I thought that that would be sort of a fun, uh, a fun way of looking at it is there's, you know, um, things that when you're building the app that you might have wanted to do different and uh, there's uh, um, opportunities to improve as well. So this is Island Tracker. Uh, Island Tracker is a social uh, turnip tracking application that enables you um, when you're playing um, Animal Crossing to easily track your turnip prices with all of your friends. Now, if you don't know anything about Animal Crossing, that's okay, you don't need to. I'll explain what this application was for and what it is for today and on the App Store. And you can go to islandtracker.app to, to see the application and, and see it on the App Store. Um, when you're playing Animal Crossing, which is a game for the Nintendo Switch, um, it is a game in which you kind of build your, your town, you have villagers, sort of like the Sims in a way, but everyone are everyone's animals besides you. You are building your house, you're getting stuff in it, you're buying and selling goods at the, the local market. And during um, Sunday um, and throughout the week, there's some, a special event that happens on Sundays, which is that... This character in the game, Daisy May, visits your town, visits everybody's town in the entire world, basically, and she sells you turnips. And they call this thing the stock market. Now, kind of like the stock market, but the stock, like a stock. And uh, the whole goal of it is that you buy uh, your turnips at a specific price, and that varies every time that she comes to your town, and it's different on everybody's island. And uh, then throughout the week, you are able to sell your turnips that you buy back to the shop. Now, the kicker here is that those turnip prices change twice a day and they're different every single day. So what I found is when I first started playing the game is that I would start a either a Google Doc uh, Excel spreadsheet or a group text, text message um, thread, and I would just text all my friends nonstop, what are your turnip prices? What are your turnip prices? Can I come over? Because I might be buying turnips for 100 on my island, but on my friend's island, it might have this huge spike of 500. And in fact, there's an algorithm that um, people have data mined to figure out how this thing works. So you can get predictions. Like, oh, my prediction is 500, or wait, over here this next day. So I said, man, it's so tedious to try to text message everyone over and over and over again. What if I had a way of creating a social network of friends where I could see their predictions and their prices as they're updating them in real time? And that's why Island Tracker was born. It was a way to stop text messaging friends and easily see all of your friends' turn up prices. And that way you can make some profit in the game. So I had some goals set out when I went to first build this application. The first one was that I wanted a good looking application. I really wanted to take advantage of the latest design paradigms, a lot of the open source uh, initiatives, and there was graphs and charts that could be associated with it. So I wanted to do that. I also wanted to be able to track my weekly turn up prices and get predictions, like I said earlier. Um, that actually had led to some, some, some craziness because the prediction model was a JavaScript uh, class at an individual road, and one of uh, uh, my Twitch viewers converted to C Sharp, which is really cool. It's in the code base. Uh, Sparky did that, which is really cool. I want to be able to sync data um, and my profile with a backend. I've built a lot of applications, and I've, I've built a few with backends, but uh, not necessarily for for at scale, uh, maybe a few thousand people, but I wanted to have constant updates. Um, before this, maybe the biggest app that did syncing was like the conference applications I, I built, but there were smaller bits of data and didn't have you know, profiles and things like that. It was more social login. I wanted a simple friend system. I didn't want any logins. That was the goal, no login. There's no social auth, there's no auth system. There's nothing like that. Uh, I wanted to be able to view and sync friend statuses and their prices in my application. And down the road, I wanted to have the ability to maybe add push notifications or desktop support. So I think uh, that last feature really sort of made sure like, hey, I was already going to do it in Xamarin, but if I'm going to go cross platform, I want to have a backend that's in .NET. I want my, my mobile apps to be in .NET. 
And I want the ability to do push notifications with a native app in the future, and maybe even create a desktop app if I need to too. So those are sort of my high level goals uh, there. But I knew the first five I really wanted to have for a V1. And that's where Island Tracker was born. And this is actually what it looks like. Uh, it's a, I think it's a really great looking UI um, that uses a lot of new paradigms, uh, uses more of this acrylic -y card elevated view on top of it. It looks nearly identical between iOS and Android. As you can see, there are some differences. Um, the icon size is a little bit different. Some spacing consideration is a little bit different just because of widths of phones and things like that. But in general, uh, I wanted them to look nearly identical. I'm using some custom fonts here with that friends and the open thing to nearly identical. Uh, and that was sort of my, my goal. And, and I think it, it, it came off pretty good. Uh, in general, you can see there's some differences in some of the artwork is the same, but a lot of the rest of it uses emojis, uh, which I thought was actually really cool. <laughs> so you can just use emoji as artwork, but of course they are different between iOS and Android. Uh, but as far as the sheer code base of it, I want it to be nearly identical and I wanted the apps to look nearly identical too. That's where Xamarin Form Shell came into the equation. I started this application new, so it's completely greenfield. And I had never used Xamarin Forms shell for a full application. I had started to convert some of my other applications over, but I never really filed new, really took advantage of some of the new things that they were doing. Um, Homero says, looks similar to new neomorphism. Yeah, kind of that, that vein as well. I was definitely going for that inspiration. Good, good point on, yeah. Uh, Frank and I talk about that on Merge Conflict, that's true. Uh, so I don't have a specific name for it, but that is probably the neomorphism is similar-esque, not 100%, because you can see I didn't follow it 100%, like with the toggle buttons and stuff like that, uh, but it's there. So I got excited about Shell uh, for many reasons that I'll get into, uh, but I thought it would be a great way to sort of simplify the architecture of the app going forward, change over to a URI-based navigation, which I'll talk about here, and... Uh, really start fresh with like, hey, this is the direction of Xamarin Forms. Team's been, you know, really pushing. I've been watching Shane nonstop on his on his streams and conference sessions. I really need to embrace. And through embracing, I, I, be, I fell in love. I, I did a session during Build on the Microsoft Developer Twitch on my new love and passion uh, for it. I have presented at... Uh, for some students as well on navigation, and, and they really fell in love with it, just how easy it was. And to me, it sort of made sense. Instead of pushing pages, you're pushing URLs, and it knows how to do stuff. So we'll talk about that here in a bit. But Shell, if you're brand new to it, it, it the whole concept is an opinionated way of creating a, a shell of your application. So it's an app shell. And you put all of your pages, your infrastructure, and you let the shell handle the navigation, the theming, the styling, um, the tabs, the flyout. It does everything for you. So shell by default has a few modes. You can just display a page, um, or you can have a flyout navigation, bottom tabs, top tabs, bottom and top tabs. You can have flyout too. You can have all of them. All the things are there too. So in this application, I used bottom tabs. So inside of my app shell, I have a tab bar and it has some tabs. Um, I could have, if I had multiple um, pages inside of a tab, it would be top tabs. But as we can see, I have three tabs. I have a home, tracking, and friends. And what's great here is that inside of each of these, I can clearly have a title. So I have title home, route home, and that's gonna be the URL of home is my route. I have a icon. And we're seeing here that I'm using font awesome for my font image source. And I'm using a glyph here. It's a string for my resources. And I'm using the font awesome solid family here, the free version of it. And then I have a shell piece of content. So on the fifth or so piece of line, we have that. And I have this thing called a content template. So how shell works is instead of loading everything up in memory, it loads it on demand. So as I flip to a tab, it then loads this data template, if you will, this content template to say, load this page. And this is really, really nice. I could add a flyout page really, really easy on top of here if I needed to. Uh, but what we're seeing is just very simple. Boom, that is my application. It's the shell. 
I can push pages modally on top of it inside of tabs and I have full control there too, which is nice, but that's how shell really simplifies the page. Now, I also decided to leverage a few other controls um, from the latest version of Xamarin Forms that really became really nifty. So if I talk about how I built this application, this is how I put it together. I started um, with collection view with groupings. So when I have this toggle of updates and gates, I can toggle between the different modes there. Collection view was an easy transition from list view. It super improved my performance really made it really, really easy to update and had all this grouping and things built right in. I also added these custom swipe options with the new swipe view that's built right in. So when a user comes in and swipes underneath, I have these little cards underneath to remove uh, or to view a friend code inside of it. And you can swipe up and down and left and right, and you can add as many of those as you would like, completely customized. So this has a similar feel to what an iOS user would be used to, or even Android user swiping, but it has a custom view under, underneath with some font awesome controls, which is cool. I also used some amazing community controls to make this a uh, pretty good looking application, as Homero says too, it says it's a pretty good looking application. Um, so, and honestly, after Xamarin Forms, I used tons of built-in Xamarin Forms controls, shell, all this stuff that was built in, but there's this amazing Xamarin Forms and Xamarin community of .NET developers with these amazing controls. So I figured, you know, kind of talk about how I put this together. The first thing is Pancake View. Pancake View is very, very cool. Um, it's a custom card view. Um, it enables you to customize corner radiuses. It has gradient support. It's very flexible. I use this in a few different places. I actually use it here and here. You would think that it's for these main cards, but it's not. I'll talk about that next. But you can note that the, it's pretty flat design because it's a card. It has a, a drop shadow uh, right underneath that home and that profile, but it's flexible. So I have rounded corners in this sort of card scrolly thing, as I call it. That's what I'll call it. I kind of this new way of adding corners on it. But you can add different corner radiuses uh, for um, top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. You're in full control. I could also add a gradient as the full background if I needed to too, which is very nice with gradient stops. Works fully cross-platform across iOS, Android, Windows. I think Mac support's coming soon. And I also use it up top here on the top right. Now it is very similar to the card or the um, frame in Xamarin Forms, but I think it's just a little bit more consistent um, as far as the corner radius is and that control. So that's why I decided to use it there. Now for those main views um, that you see that uh, were, were neomorphism, as Homero said, uh, these is, this is something from my good friend Jean-Marie um, from Sharpnado. Uh, uh, he has this awesome library called Sharpnado, but he broke out um, this thing called Material Frame. And Material Frame is really cool. It's what I use in nearly all aspects of the application. And Material Frame gives different styling. He called this acrylic, but it's kind of neomorphism in a way. There's a dark theme, a light theme. Um, there's a blur theme, so you can blur backgrounds and things like that using the native theming. I'm using the acrylic version here, so if you're looking at this control, um, you could do that. It's very similar to the card view or the pancake view, like I said, um, but they play nice together when you want different styles in your application. You want different rounded corners or different um, drop shadow effects back and forth. It's very customizable, very themable, which I, which I absolutely love. I also used a bunch of Sync Fusion controls. Um, so Sync Fusion has a free community uh, addition. Here I'm using a combo box, a numeric up down, a masked entry so they can only enter specific digits and, and numbers um, inside that Dodo code. I'm using this thing called an input layout. So as this replays here, you'll see kind of the emoji status goes up to the top of it. It would fill it as a placeholder. Same thing here, I wrap this in the status. Same thing with the Dodo code that you saw go up there. And if you see here the sync button, when I tap it, it does that little shim, shimmer there. That's a little effects view that you can add to anything, which is really, really cool. So I combined using the sync fusion controls and I said, you know what, if I sell a million dollars worth of this stuff, I will you know, get a license for sync fusion, but you can get a free community edition, which is cool. And these are just some of the controls that are kind of similar to Xamarin Forms. Like you can do most of this stuff in Xamarin Forms. 
Um, but I was like, you know, I already including a bunch of the sync fusion stuff. It just helps me get the little bit more, um, custom style without having to write the custom renderer. I also put in, um, charts and graphs. So this is a beautiful chart and graph, um, that I put in for the, the turn up prices, the min and max days inside of here. And I also use their expander control. Um, this is one that sync fusion has. Um, but now Xamarin Forms has one, so I've been looking at swapping it out. Um, and and I and I may go with the Xamarin Forms one because the little chev here. See in the top right, there's that little chev arrow up down. It's not quite as customizable in the Sync Fusion one as it is fully in the in the Xamarin Forms one. Um, but um, I do like this a lot. Is it, it was gave me a lot more real estate in the application. Um, to, to show this because I didn't need it all the time. I just, you know, the user was really in control there, um, which is nice. And um, I also use a bunch of helpful packages besides UI controls that I figured I'd talk about here in building it. Uh, first thing is I use this library um, called MVVM Helpers. Um, it's simple, straightforward. I built it, it's from me. Uh, I use it in every single one of my applications ever. Uh, it's a bunch of helper classes, has async command in it, observable range collection. That should be observable object, a bunch of nice little things. It's not an MVVM framework, but it is an MVVM sort of helper library in a way. I also use something called Resizatizer NT. This is a library from my good friend, Jonathan Dick, or Reth, R-E-D-T-H, uh, on Twitter. And it does sort of cross-platform images, uh, similar to sort of where the .NET MAUI stuff is going, but you add all of your images into one folder and it automatically compiles everything for you into the specific sizes that you need, um, which is really helpful. I also use Font Awesome, which you saw, uh, in a bunch of the icons and glyphs that I use throughout. And those are using embedded fonts uh, with a single line of code, which I'll show off when I go into the code there. And I also use something called Monkey Cache, which is another library that I created. Uh, and this is because I don't have a database in my application. I use a lot of Xamarin Essentials to store preferences and different data and things like that. But I needed to store temporary weekly data. Uh, so every week I wanted to track that data. So Monkey Cache lets you traditionally store cache into a folder that is deleted by the system whenever. And I use Monkey Cache um, for that when I'm querying RESTful backend services, um, usually. So I can cache that if you're offline, just return the cache data. But um, in this instance, I use the Monkey Cache as a permanent cache. You can, you can override the, the location of where Monkey Cache stores your data to put it into a permanent location. That's what I'm doing here which is cool. So if you're ever looking for something simple, I just use file cache. So it's just a file, write, write a file to the disk. So that's sort of the application, how I built it. Uh, but of course the front end and the, the, the user interface is only one half of it. I also want to talk about a back end that I built for it. So my goals here with the back end is that I didn't want to have a server. I didn't want to have to have a always on server that was hanging out always there. I didn't want databases because I'm not a SQL expert. I did need a data source per se, <laughs> but I didn't want a database, uh, like a SQL database. I didn't want to pay for two things. That was kind of my goal with it. Uh, but I did want it to be affordable and I wanted it to scale if I needed. So I use an architecture that I've sort of fallen in love with for my backend, which is Azure Functions. And if you've ever watched me on Twitch build some of my applications, I use Azure Functions as a way of querying and store data, data into blob storage, um, just JSON files and serving them up. But I don't want to just save things as JSON files. I want to put them into some data-esque format. And that's where I fell in love with table storage, part of Azure storage. And Azure table storage is a really drop-dead simple key value, key, it's, it's key-based but it has multiple values inside of it. So it, there, there's rows of data inside of a table. So you have a user table with all of your users and they have different keys associated with them. So the whole goal here is that the mobile application always talks to the Azure function backend for everything, 100%. And then the Azure functions will communicate with the table storage uh, on top of here to query data, insert data, update data, delete data, everything like that. And I'll use Azure functions as my 
um, RESTful API for all intents and purposes. And the reason I can use Azure Functions as my RESTful API is because uh, it's really cheap, <laughs> to be honest with you. Uh, the first month of production, I spent less than one penny on Azure Functions, um, which is amazing, uh, with several hundred users. So you can imagine scaling it out to millions will, will be also very cheap too. And Azure Table Storage was also very cheap for the first month, uh, sub 80 cents, or about 60 cents, 70 cents or so, um, for this use case that I have. And I haven't really optimized that functionality too, too much, but I have started to look at some optimizations there. So this is how the flow goes, goes back and forth, back and forth. And this was nice because I thought about, well, how, what about in the future where I want to add push notifications or other things? So I could use, uh, uh oh, we got some, got John on his computer. Uh oh, oh, there we go. That's not me. That was John. <laughs> OneDrive. All right, cool. We're back. So I thought maybe how else could you inject some other things, like maybe queue storage or Azure queues. So if I you know, notify someone of other um, prices, I could then add, add every update to the queue, process it, and then send push notifications. So having this serverless architecture was very nice. So let's first talk about the users, because the user holds all the data. I want to have this user system. And the user system, I wanted to make it very, very simple. I call this the Frank Kruger architecture because he told me this is how I should do it. Um, and then I did it. Um, so I wanted to have it very simple, private and public keys. Those, that is your user. It's just like your identifier, but instead of having an email and a social authentication, when you start up the application, you have a private and a public key. Hey, Brian, how's it going? And Daniel as well, good to see you. The private key would be stored and is private to the user. Um, in general here, the whole goal was that this is for server communication. Only my mobile device and myself know the private key and only the server know my private key. When I register, I make that handshake and that's the only part in which the authentication or bearer token is exchanged. And that's encrypted across the wire with HTTPS and a normal sort of bearer token authentication. The public key, on the other hand, would be shareable, you know, and the combination of them is a user. So all of my friends can have my public key and they can say, hey, give me all of my friends' statuses. And when they make that query, they send their private key and their public key together up to the server. They can go grab all of their friends from the database and query the friend's statuses. It's a very nice way to be able to do that. And additionally, um, it's how the friend system works. Uh, you can share your public key with your friend, and that's how you're able to share data with it. In fact, if you ever have used a Nintendo Switch, it's very similar to how the Nintendo Switch works. The Nintendo Switch itself, you have a Switch code, a friend code, that you can give to your friends to send friend requests, and then you can see each other. So that's sort of how it works there. Now these codes, these keys, if you will, are GUIDs, and these are generated when the app is created. And I store them in the keychain via Xamarin Essentials Secure Storage. So I only generate them once. When you first create your account, boom, you have them right away. And I do have a way to import and export profiles, which is a little bit more, uh, but they are tied to your device. I think that's the that's the one thing I wasn't really in love with necessarily, but it's tied to your device. So. If you upgrade your operating system, obviously that's going to upgrade. If you transfer device to device, that's going to kind of depend on your iCloud data backup situation, right? It may go or it may not go, um, but I do have a way of exporting and re-importing your data uh, very easily in the app with a button click. So some users, you can almost think of it as two-factor auth where you have those export codes. You can always export your code and re-import it into any device later. And that's a user, very simple. And then beyond that, it's just POCO option. Uh, you know, it's the POCO option. It has a private and public key, and then everything else is there. So I have a bunch of demos here, and I'm going to show you my back end um, and how this ac actual application works. So let's go into, I think I can close this. Let me go into Visual Studio. And I'm going to go ahead and bump up my fonts to 160. Let's go ahead and close a bunch of stuff here. There we go. So I want to show you the application really quick. Let's go ahead and zoom in. And 
I have my normal Xamarin stuff down here. So I have my, my turnip tracker down here. I have all my XAML pages, blah, 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 blah. So many XAML pages, which is cool. I have all my dependencies, all the packages that you would suspect. Look at all those. Look at all that sync fusion stuff in there. So much stuff, which is cool. Um, and then I have my Android and iOS projects here. And I then have my Azure functions. So my Azure functions enable me to run uh, locally and do all my development locally on my machine, test everything 100% using Azure Storage Explorer on both Mac and PC, um, which is cool. And this is where I have all of my gets and sets. So I have things like create profile, um, which over here is a post. And I have an update profile, which is a put. Like, look at me, I followed proper RESTful services. Good thing I have a, a, a wife that is an API expert and told me how to do this. Um, I also have update, uh, which is actually a put. It should be maybe an upsert, perhaps, uh, but it doesn't support that, so I put a put there. It was very close, I would say. I have other things in here, like approve friend requests, which are posts, get friend request count, which is a get, obviously. And these are just simple Azure functions. And what I want to point out here is that every Azure function is an authentication function. So uh, somebody needs a little auth key to, to do that. Um, I send in parameters. This is really cool. On the get, I have a route that says call get friend request my public key. It'll automatically send it down, right? Because we're not passing any additional things here. We're going to pass that down. And it also grabs two Azure um, table storage cloud tables. So this is really nifty. Every Azure function account comes with an Azure storage account that you're already paying for, and it has table storage built into it. So I am saying, give me my friend request and my user table, which is really cool. And that passes it down 100%. So I just call this, the Azure function will handle querying everything, handle validation of user codes, everything like that, and just does it automatically. And I love the debuggability of it here. So I'm just going to start running the Azure function here locally and then show you how the data works. I've cleared out all the data so it's fresh. And uh, I have some fresh apps that I have here. So let's go ahead and build this here. And we'll get it running. There we go. So it should be starting up. Perfect. And this is really nice because often I'd have some multiple Visual Studios and I'd debug the Azure functions and debug my applications at the same time. So there we go. So I'm going to open up this application here. So there we go. It's running. I'm just going to open this up. Feel free to ask questions and everything like that if you, if you have questions as well. So here it's going to it just started up everything. It um, has gone in. It says, here are my APIs, local host. So I have approve, create, get friend requests, public key, reject friend, you know, these other things, remove friend, submit friend request, all the different APIs. And um, what this is talking to here is my local storage here. So I'm just going to drop this down. Let's go here. Let's go here. I'm going to go over into my, is it my attached storage? Emulated storage. Here we go. So we can attach containers or we can do emulated things. And we have tables. There we go. So here, if I go into my, my um, Azure Storage Explorer, that's what this is. Azure Storage Explorer. And you can get that on anything. It has my blobs, my queues, and my tables. So I have a friend, a friend request, and a friend table. So I create these, and I create these in Azure over there. And we can see that they're um, um, completely blank right now. So we'll go ahead and let this spin up. It's probably on Skype, so it's probably a little bit slower. I, don't know, I guess I can refresh. Let me go ahead and close these down here. There we go. Cool. Uh, Good question. Uh, John was asking in the chat, how do you protect function auth code on the device? Great, great question. I'll, I'll show you that in code, John, as well. Good question. So here's what's going to happen is I'm going to go ahead and create my profile. So I'm going to go over here. The first time the user starts the application, they're brought over to the screen to create a profile, but I was debugging it earlier. So we'll just say this will be um, uh, MOTS1 and on the island of Fafa. Here I can select, uh, let's say I have oranges on mine, and here's one of those masked um, items here, and I'll just go ahead and put that in, my friend code, and I can then hit uh, create on here. 
Now this will go off and this should call into my Azure function backend, um, which should be running here. There we go. So the post gets hit here. It's creating the profile and executing it. And then boom, I've created my profile. If I refresh, boom, I have my data. I can double tap on this partition key. I've given them hard-coded keys here for the demo purposes, but this is what an entity looks like uh, over here. I have our partition key and a row key. One is my public key and one is my private key that I have, they're two quids. And then I have just information. So ints, date times, um, strings, uh, any, there's a bunch of different data types, booleans, binary, you can add a bunch of stuff in here, but they're all here, uh, which is really cool. So I have different emoji statuses and a bunch of different things that I can put in here. And some of them I don't even use right now. And they're all in here, which is cool. And if I come over back into the application and if I um, uh, update this to say, you know, cherry, actually let's, let's do something more visible, like i um, change my name, hit sync again. I can come over and refresh this again. And now we'll see that we have um, MOTS2 right here instead of MOTS1. So it's sending that back and forth. Now how this works, and John was asking how do I protect the function auth code on the device, it, it actually doesn't matter too much, to be honest with you, um, because the private key is, is, is how it secures this data. So how this works is inside of my app, I have a big list of keys. So I, at build time, I swap out the URL and my Azure function key. So every single one of those methods that I call has a different um, key associated with it. So it's function key. So I, I have a build script. I can actually show it to you here and for App Center, which I build on. And I switch out a bunch of different you know, app secrets, keys, all sorts of different things that I'm storing in my environment variables on App Center. But how this works is, is like this. Uh, I have a function, and let's say that one, which is create. So this will be a good example because I just did create an update. So what I'll do over here, let's go into my data service class. And let me go into my data service class. There we go. And I'll do upsert. I have upsert um, user profile. And uh, this is pretty cool. So I get my profile or I pass it in. And I create my user. So this is my user here. And the user has all the information that I showed. I'd update it. I make sure things aren't null and all that stuff. And then here I get my, my public key. And that is coming from uh, my Xamarin, uh, Xamarin Essentials. So I go and I get my key. And when I get my key, it go ahead and it grabs it from the secure storage over here. And it just does some validation on the back end. Now the kicker here is this, is when I go ahead and create this, um, we can see that I put, do a put or a post. And here I either call update profile or create profile. And this is how I make the call. So the app code is inside of the device. So that's technically not the most secure thing in the entire world, uh, but it's there. And uh, over here, I have my content that I'm sending. Now the, the, the key of it is whenever I do a put or a post or anything, I come in and I just have very simple HTTP calls. So I call put async, get the response, do some proper validation. But I have this key thing called set header. And the set header is the real key, which adds the authentication header into it. So how this works is I go in and I go ahead and I grab the authentication I'll see if it uh, has the authorization flag on. And if it doesn't, I'll grab my private key over here. And the private key is the key that unlocks the functionality in the back end. I do some encoding on it. I send it to a base64 string, and then I simply create a new bearer token, authentication header value. And that's how the back end works. Now in my back end, when I go over to my profile and I say create profile, We'll see that that looks pretty similar. I go in, I have this util called parse token. And when I go in here and I go into definition, every single time I call it, it goes in. And what it does is it takes my authentication header value. It verifies that it exists. It 
gets the encoding, converts it from base 64 and converts it to a GUID. And that's how I know it's valid. Now, additionally, anyone could pass me any GUID and that would be valid, but they would have to have the correct combination of my private GUID and my public GUID because the first thing I do is I, uh, well, this is create, so it's create, but let's say I'm updating my profile. After I get that information, I ensure that that user exists. So in that call, there's multiple guards. There's one, they'd have to somehow get that HTTP request with that token. They'd have to get the GUI. They'd have to serialize it correct. There's, unless you crack into the keychain, you're not getting that GUID per se. So that's sort of the authentication model I did there back and forth. So there's no, you know, easy auth or anything like that on it. It just boom is just right there. Now, um, hopefully that answers some questions. Um, and this was uh, the Frank architecture that I said earlier. Um, then we have this, right? And, and the whole goal is that I have a very easy way of coming in, um, going in, setting different statuses. I can update this, it turns blue. It just updated it really quick there. I can come into my turnip tracking. And today I could say it was 190 and maybe this afternoon it's 150 over here. And I could set my, my buy price here of maybe 100. So we're back on Wednesday. So we get some information that I'd be making some money. I could look at my predictions. I get a nice little graph over here saying I should probably sell right now because this is the, the most it'll ever be. And then I can also sync that to the back end, which is cool. Uh, good question. Hamira was asking, um, what are my monthly costs for the Azure table storage? So, so far, um, with several hundred users, my, uh, with no optimizations, I should say, uh, my Azure functions costs are about one penny and my Azure table storage costs, which I'm using hot is about 60 cents so far. So that's what I'm at currently. And again, I haven't really super optimized it, but I am looking at further ways of optimizing some of the calls there. Now, if I refresh this, there's some things that are gonna happen here. So in fact, if I double tap on this, I'll see that um, uh, if I double tap on this entry, let's see if it's gonna open, there we go. So we can see I have a new AM price. My, um, I didn't update my, my purchase price here, but I do have, uh, my max prediction of 90 minimum prediction here and my PM price. So it's all this, all this different data here is going to help me share that in general, but yeah, yeah, the Azure storage account is very cheap and, and you can then of course use other things too, like file storage and queues and whatnot too, but very cheap. So I'm not sure at scale yet, but I'm assuming that it will be not that bad. So, but we'll see as it grows. Uh, yeah. Cool. So that's just a little demo of how the back end and Azure functions work and how I update it in the back end, um, back and forth. But let's continue because I think the real magic of this entire thing is the friend system. Again, this is the Frank Kruger friend system. I'm very excited about it. Uh, and it works very, very well. And it works a little bit like this. I'm James. I am Mots over here, if you will. And I want to have Homero be my friend. And this is funnily how the Nintendo Switch system works. So for that to initiate, what I'm gonna do is inside of my application, I am gonna share my friend code or my friend link with Homero. And Homero gets it in uh, a text message and an email and anything. And he's like, oh cool, I got this link. And he taps on it and he'll be brought into the application where he can send me a friend request. A friend request gets sent into the system and I get notified inside of my application that I have a new friend request. And at that point, I can approve or deny that request in the system. And if I approve it, we're friends. We can see each other's data. If either of us remove that friend, then we break that friend link. And then we can restart the process over. So I get a friend link. I send it to, a, to my friend. They click on it. Inside the application, they submit a friend request to me, I approve or deny, and then boom, it's there. So it is the opposite. It's more of a Facebook style where I can request to be your friend and you have to approve it. Unlike Twitter, which is I can follow everybody by default. So that's the difference in the system there. So let me show you what's really cool about this too and how this works really well with Xamarin Form Shell because I wanted to make it drop dead simple 
for anyone to click on that link or open that link inside the application. Since it's a GUID, it's not very pretty, we wanted to make it pretty simple. So how it works is that Xamarin Form Shell has an amazing navigation service based on URLs built right in. So if I have a master page of this sort of master detail page of, of city list page, I wanna to go to a detail page, I could navigate to it using shell, current, go to async detail. I could go backwards by doing dot dot, sort of kind of like in the command line, which is kind of cool. I can also do other things such as send information across the wire too. So I can do detail, question mark, ID equals city dot ID, and that will send that information over to the next page. It's pretty cool. So here, for example, we see city ID with this query property up top. And when I pass that data, Xamarin Form Shell will automatically send that data and set the property in my page or in my view model automatically, which is really cool. So this is what a friend code and island tracker looks like. It's not beautiful, okay? It's not elegant by any means, but it's not trying to be. That's the difference. So the key here is that I have a few important parts. The first is AC Island Tracker. That is my URI scheme. I could also do this with HTTPS. I'd have to do some configuration on a web server, but I don't have a website. So I did a custom URI scheme. Now this is pretty nice uh, because on Android, if other people use this URI scheme, it would ask what app to open it in, things like that. On iOS, it's a little bit trickier, but you know, I think they do some stuff in the back end to try to con do consistency, but you register it with the, the iOS or Android app. And then inside of here, I have the URI route. So what this is telling um, Xamarin Forms when it opens, it says, go to the friends page and then go to the invite page and pass this data to it which is cool. And what we see here is I give it an ID, which is my public GUID, and I also give it the name. So this way I don't have to do any validation on the back end or any API calls. It's just, hey, here's the name that I sent you. And you sent, you got it from your friend, so you know who it is. So ideally that should be okay. I just want something to display. Now inside the application, this is really neat. This is the code from the app. Inside of my application uh, class, I have this thing called on app link request received. Xamarin Forms automatically will handle deep linking for you. What I do here is when I start, I get this request. I verify that you didn't accidentally tap on your own key. That would be, that'd be silly if you did, but it's possible, mostly for debug purposes. I then call this method. Remember how it could call detail or call pass some information? I am literally passing it go to async slash slash friend slash invite plus all that data parameter query stuff. And that's it. Xamarin form shell will automatically make sure those pages are propagated. The application is open and the data gets sent across. And this is what it looks like. I send an email to myself and I tap on it and it opens directly to the friend request page. I tap on it and it opens my application and goes right to the friend request page where I can accept or decline. Boom. Super cool. It's exactly how you'd want it to work. So it's like, bam, good to go. So let me show you what this looks like uh, in action. So over here, I'm going to open my app over here. And we're going to open the other app on uh, my other emulator. And my machine is being has all the memory used on all these emulators, <laughs> which is great. So it's a little bit slow to open here, but uh, we'll give it some some resources here. So let's let it open. And we haven't created the other user account yet either. That's an important um, thing to remember. And ideally should open, come on. There we go. And we can see I'm using, I haven't, I don't check into source code my Syncfusion license. So I get this pop up every time. Let's go ahead and create an account over here. I'm gonna go ahead and Go to my homepage, click on profile, and we're gonna say that this is Hamera because he's uh, in the chat, very active. And we'll say his island is Lara Island. There we go. And we'll say that he has a pair. And we'll go ahead and no friend code, that's fine. And we'll just say create. So it'll sync that profile created and let's also give Homero 
Let's give him Hamero a different emoji. Let's give some love, love emojis, some emoji status. Sync that up there. Let's go to our tracking and we'll say, you know, 50 today and uh, 80 this afternoon. And we'll sync that up. And Hamera, it's really fast. That's another thing too, is like it just made all those API calls super duper fast. It's local obviously, but it also is very, very fast too, especially when the function's warm. So let's initiate this process uh, over here. I'm gonna go to my friends page and I'm gonna go ahead and hit this little arrow that says, let's send a friend request. So this will pop up over here. I'm gonna go ahead and copy it to my clipboard. Now, I could share this via text message. I could do a bunch of different things in the app. Um, since I have it on the clipboard, I actually detect if you have it on the clipboard when you go to this page. You could also come and tap this button in here too. Um, so there's a m multiple ways of doing it because deep linking is good, but different apps handle it differently. Like WhatsApp handles it a little bit different. So I gave a way of entering it manually. So you can just enter and paste it in here, or you can just go into this page. So, so far, nothing has um, called the back end um, at all, but let's go ahead and add a friend. Sending friend requests, friend request sent successful. You will see your friend as soon as they accept their friend request on their app. Cool. Let's go ahead and refresh this page over here. Oh, and I have a friend request right there, right there. Super cool. All right. So now if I look at my back end and we look at our friend request information here, let's pop this open. There we go. We have one entry, which is partition key and row key. So it's the most simplest and a timestamp. These are, this is the minimum that you have to have in a table row. The partition key is the, um, is the friend that is requesting and the row key is the requester. So it kind of goes back and forth. So I can easily query, say, give me all my friends. So the person that said, I want to be your friend, you know, they, they enter this in when they do that. So that way, when I tap on this, I'm calling the Azure function that says, give me all of my friend requests and go give me information about them. So if I go ahead and look over here at the function where I say, get, a uh, friend requests, I come in, I have a get that says, give me my keys, my, my friends. I do the normal parsing, make sure my public key is valid. I make sure that I'm an actual user in the system. And then over here, I do something pretty cool, which is I go in and I say, give me all of my friend requests. So I go ahead and I query with this nice link query syntax. I'll say, I'll create a table query where my partition key is me. So give me all of my friend requests. I grab all those back. I grab them here. And then what I do is I create a task that I'll say, let me go find all of my, all the information about that friend. So here I'll go ahead and find a friend and that will give me some information back. And I sort of grab that information and say, return this information, which is, when it was created, the island name, the name, and the public key of the user. And that's it. So I grab that data back. I can I can approve or, or deny, but I'll just go ahead and approve Homero. I'll say yes, approve. And now boom, I have uh, successfully added a friend request. If I go over here into my data, I refresh it, the data is gone. If I open up the table row, data here in, um, inside the table, I'll see that I have two entries. And I did this for speed consistency because I wanted to be able to say, give me all of my friends via the partition key. So I have two entries, one with friend one, friend two, so kind of one relationship and the other relationship. So they're saying the same thing and uh, that's how you do it. It's a little tedious because you have to do two entries and additionally, when you delete it, you have to delete both of them and make sure they're in sync, but the back end handles it and it's kind of good to go there. So let's go ahead now and refresh over here, refresh over here. And just like that, we can see that Homero is my friend with his beautiful emojis on Laura Island. Over here, I have my uh, Mots 2, which is the one on the right. And we're best friends in the entire world. I can see that I'm actually have my gates open so you can come fly to my island. Um, I can go ahead and swipe over and we could remove, we could do the friend code here. You could see my friend code. 
Very cool. There's some grouping here. So you could do multiple friends and groupings and all this stuff. There's, there's not a lot of great data if there's only one, but this is like if gates are open or not. Um, updates that text there. I should also say that I have this really, I, don't, I can't really see it, but there's a really cool shimmer that happens when it goes and gets the data. It's just too fast to see it, but it kind of does a cool shimmery thing. But that's how we do a friend request system with no login, no credentials, no any, I mean, no, not, I mean, no friend code, nothing besides a friend codes at all. So as a user, I just use my application. I send it out and we're good to go. Now, if I decide that I don't want to be the friend, we can just remove it over here. If I go ahead and tap it gone, just like that. If I come into my backend, boom, data is gone. We can also come in and, um, do something cool. So I can show you this. Let's say we re do the friend process. So I'll say tap and let's go ahead and copy this to the clipboard. And let's say I come in and I, and I, I'm, I share this via text message over here. So let's say I come into my SMS and I'll show you some of the deep linking capabilities. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to create a new uh, message here and let's just do, uh, I don't know, do, 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 hit okay. It doesn't really matter what it is. And I'll just paste this in, do, 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 do. paste it in. Now, some applications will allow you to just tap on it. So I could just tap on it, um, which is uh, fascinating. This one doesn't, unfortunately. Um, but I've also built in the ability to just say open with. So here I can just say open with, and I can say open with Island Tracker uh, over here uh, in the share sheet, uh, which is another option. And that will sort of kick off a very similar process over here. So I can go in. I can see, oh, Amero has uh, asked me to do this. I'll approve it. I'll close it down. We'll refresh it. There we go. And now we're friends again. And everything's happy. Just like that. It's super duper cool. Um, and that's how it works. And you can, you know, we can swipe, uh, swipe away, swipe back and forth. And you got the whole thing going, which is really nice. All with this sort of Azure function backend. And everything's just been running locally. I can test my entire application. I can push it up. All right. So that is Island Tracker in a nutshell, sort of using the brand new Xamarin Form shell, using amazing third-party controls with Syncfusion, using amazing community controls with Pancake View, Resizitizer, Material Frame, all that stuff. But I thought it wouldn't be a, a session without having some unexpected learnings. So, um, and things maybe that I'd go back and change. So let me go ahead and let me get out of this again. I don't know how to make this focus, but let's go back in here and full screen it. Oh, it's still gonna be there, okay. So the first thing was adding personality. When I was building this application, I just had normal user profile stuff and that was fine. And Frank, when I was building this application said, you need to give people a way to add personality, some flair to it. So I added this little thing where you could have an emoji status. And I thought this would be fun. People might just use it to see how they're feeling today or maybe they'll never update it or who knows. Um, or undocumented features. That's correct, Jay says uh, in, in, the, in the chat. I agree. Well, this led to something very fascinating. Inside the game of Animal Crossing, there's a bunch of different events that happen on your island. It could be raining, it could be sunny, it could be nighttime, it could be a comet storm, like in different comets coming down. There could be different visitors on your island. And then I got a tweet um, from Vanessa, a user of the application that really enjoyed the app. And they said, she said, I'm already debating whether, whether emoji status should be stars or should be Al because um, Celeste, who's a character, is on your island or doing something like, hey, you can buy artwork today or I have another character that's selling um, different goods or the sloth that sells different plants around my island. Like, how cool is that, that I limited it to two emojis, but now you can you can use it for this like messaging of what's happening on your island. I thought that was so cool, the creativity that came out of two little bits of emoji that I put into the application to give it that personality flair. I thought that was so cool. I also thought what would be fascinating is that I learned a lot, which is I'm not a website developer. I'm not a web developer in any way. I'm not very great at graphics either, but I found a website called App Toolkit. I had a long discussion on Merge Conflict, the podcast that I do with Frank, of, uh, <laughs> of I need a website that shows my app. And uh, it was hard. I didn't want to publish one. I didn't want a web server. So I found this app, a website called App 
toolkit.io. It's sort of been stopped updating recently, but it does exactly what I need. And the first thing is that it helps me generate graphics for the App Store. It will use a bunch of different frames um, that are out there. Some of them you need to kind of update yourself and, and insert, but it does this cool, you know, you see all these apps with these cool backgrounds and, you know, jam, jamming off each other. Well, it does this for free for both Android and iOS and for iPad and things like that. There's certain restrictions, like you can only have so many colors and different images and things like that. But this is what I got for free uh, at the end of the day. I had to do some work to customize the iPhone X, but the other versions were all pretty much turnkey, which is cool. Um, oh, that was cool. Again, completely for free. The other thing that it did is it created an entire website for me, um, which is very, very nice. So when you go to islandtracker.app, um, I have a redirect to the, to the app toolkit.io because I didn't want to give them 10 bucks a month. And it gives you this great website, uh, which is exactly what I needed. I didn't want to host anything. I didn't want to do anything. You give it some screenshots and it shows them and you give it some information and the app store links and boom, it just does it all for you automatically, which is really, really nice. It will even enable you to add your privacy policy, support URL and things like that, which is really, really nice. So if you're looking for something like that for your app, I think it's really awesome. I'd also say ask for reviews early. This is a failing on my end. Uh, I didn't do this in the beginning of the application and I, I didn't get a lot of reviews early on. I've now in the last few weeks rolled this out and I should start to see some updates soon. But this is how I implemented it into my app. I have a plugin that I, I wrote, a little library called the Store Review Plugin. And what that does is it enables you to open the store page or request review on, on iOS, um, which pops up this dialogue. So what I'm saying here is when the user, after 30 syncs, this is my, this is my jam on it, after 30 syncs of um, my data, pop up a, a, an alert that asks them for a review. Because if they've used it 30 times, that's pretty good. Now it's going to take a, maybe a week and a half to two weeks, maybe two weeks for that to roll in. But you know, you could change this. You could have other things that sort of add to the sync count. But I wanted to put this in there. And I say after 30 counts, only when it's 30, right? If it's under 30, keep incrementing. But once it hits 30, then do this thing. And if it's Android, you 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 ask them like, hey, do you want to rate Island Tracker? Pop up the App Store, boom, boom, boom. Else on iOS, you can call one request review and it'll pop up this like little star rating on here, which is nice. That's one thing. So ask for reviews early because I didn't and I, and I didn't get a lot of reviews in the first month and I'm just starting now to get them trickling in. The other thing is set up CI and CD early. This is uh, something I did in the very first week and I'm so glad that I did. Um, I use it for my master branch and uh, App Store branch. I use uh, App Center to do this build. Uh, I did, was going to use Azure Functions and I, or uh, Azure DevOps and I probably should, um, especially for my Azure Functions but I am currently just deploying my Azure functions from my desktop and I only have deployed them ever twice. So I'm pretty okay with them. Um, but I, I do say set up CI and CD early because it's really important, especially for testing. Um, I use build, distribute, diagnostics and analytics inside of App Center, And I set it up for both iOS and Android. Um, I build on every commit uh, and I have another branch called App Store, which does different certs and some different um, swapping out of different variables inside the uh, app container um, there, which is nice. And uh, I was doing so many builds that I, I ended up paying App Center 40 bucks a month because I was just building so much uh, there. I might be able to turn it down now a little bit, but I was just, I was cranking out builds nonstop. Uh, and then this also led me to release a bunch of uh, tests uh, applications to testers uh, through App Center Distribute. I created uh, uh, an iOS and an Android public distribution group, and I had about uh, 10 testers on Android and 20 testers on iOS uh, that were getting updates. And many of those testers actually ended up buying the application when it was all done, but I still have a lot of testers using the application and testing it out. So we can see even here, when I, before I went to the App Store, I had a bunch of people update it and test it out. And it's a good way for you, you to test your App Store build you know, ahead of time, which is nice. I also, as you can see here, build 166, I sent that to um, the App Store Connect test flight. 
um, automatically through App Center. So I don't have to upload it through um, Transport or anything like that. I just put it up there. For Android, the flip is that I didn't I didn't use App Center to distribute my app because I'm using the new App Bundle flag, and that actually reduced my app size by 50%. It's only about 12 megs on Android, which is great, down from 25 using App Bundle. So it's just a little toggle in there. I also use analytics and crash reporting, which is super duper helpful, um, just to track to see how the application's doing. I did set up application import or app insight export, which was nice. Um, but some just something I ended up doing, um, which I thought um, uh, gave me a little bit more information and definitely helped um, through diagnosing some early crashes with my testers to, to turn into a better application at the end of the day. And that's it. That's Island Tracker. You can go check it out at islandtracker.app. Uh, if you are an Animal Crossing fan or know people that are using Animal Crossing or playing Animal Crossing, let them know. That's it. It's actually fully open source. So the entire application is fully open source and you can use it for inspiration of your turnip tracking application that you have. Uh, it's on my GitHub app slash uh, Island Tracker. Um, you can grab it there. Go to islandtracker.app. Um, and that's it. Um, I, if you want to hear more from me, we try to do this uh, meetup every single month, uh, which is super awesome. Uh, and we'll be back hopefully next month as well. But uh, hopefully people enjoyed it. And feel free if you have any more questions uh, in the chat. Um, I will be here um, for the next uh, 10 minutes or so and we we'll, can hang out a little. It's a one-sided conversation, but because it's just me, I usually have a, another host with me, which would be nice. But uh, that's me. And hopefully you have some, if you have any questions, let me know. I can pull this up because there's me. Ah, there's me. It's nice. It's only me. Um, let's see if anyone else has any questions at all. But I super appreciate everyone coming on. And special thanks to John and Sarah who are in the, the chat room uh, who helped set up the Donet Foundation side of things, uh, which is cool. Todd says, cool, thank you. You're welcome uh, as well. I uh, hope that you enjoyed it. So Jay asks, oh, this is great. Jay says, are there any app insights built into the app? Extra telemetry, great question. So I use App Center for that telemetry. Uh, so for example, let me find a good one here. Um, I mostly use that stuff for dot track. So I mostly just do event tracking. So like wh where users go, like I've used a code or I sync something. I don't track any PII. That's what I don't really want to do at all. So I have some just like track event here, uh, add, add friend manually versus add from a deep link. So I just sort of added that uh, in there to give me some additional information. Here's sent, like I sent a friend request. So it's mostly just that in general. Uh, so nothing uh, special. Um, so what happens is App Center uses this data and exports it into App Insights automatically. So that's what it does. And that can query over and do other stuff with all the data. Um, Daniel, really quick. Yeah, I'm going to post these slides on the meetup page. So you'll see them in the comments there. I'll do that today probably as well. And the video will be always at this link. So you can always go back and watch this. You should be able to watch it in perpetuity, which is cool. So uh, core, Corey, I'm going to say core, core W Famber, core, I'm going to say Corey, even though it's not Corey, but I'm going to say Corey. Why the decision not to use a law to log in users? Great question. Um, I just didn't want to handle auth. <laughs> It seems like a lazy excuse, but I wasn't going to be using anything from their social graphs. I would be purely using it as a, an auth token, and that's it. So I said, well, why do I need an auth token and have them log in and do credentials and do all this stuff and implement a library into the application when I can just generate a code for them? And that was it, really, to be honest with you. So nothing special. Uh, submit. Uh, ask UWP support. Not right now. Um, I've thought about it. I just think it's just development time uh, in general. I've thought about it because I am on my desktop often when I check my turnip prices. So I thought about that. Uh, right now, the only limitation I would see is that um, maybe some of the controls don't support, like maybe the material frame is only iOS and Android. Shell is might work pretty good. It's not 100% on UWP. So maybe when that's finished, I would look at it. 
that's good there. Yeah. But yeah, not right now. I'm mostly focused on iOS and Android. D d releasing apps on multiple platforms at the same exact time in a cross-platform way where all the data works is not easy, especially as a solo developer, because I do this all in my spare time. Um, Hamir says, thanks for the awesome talk, and thanks for being my friend, Hamir. I appreciate that. Uh, John says, a, few, a, a slew of things, both Azure and third-party libraries. Very cool. Awesome. Like I said, I'll put that out there. John asks if there's any crash metrics from App Center. Great question. Uh, my app didn't crash at all, so it's perfect. So there's that. Um, it's actually pretty good. Oh, Cecil, thanks for being here. I appreciate you being here. So um, I have thought about the crash stuff, and I have done stuff. So I have done some crashes and tracked some crashes um, back and forth in App Center. It's totally there. In fact, to get that crash data, all you do is go into here and you do, I have this bunch of this stuff. I say enable um, analytics and crashes in the startup code. And then I could do like, what is it? Like crashes dot, let's see if that pops up. Computer might be a little slow. There we go. So I do in, in different areas, I do this track error. So that way I can say, oh, something went wrong here and add a little bit of extra data as well in my try catches. And there's errors, but there's also exceptions. So they, they mark those differently. But I've been pretty good. Um, yep. Yeah. My video might be cutting out a little bit there. Let's see. So let's see. For your navigation, are you doing view model navigation? Hamiro asked, no, I'm doing Xamarin Form Shell uh, navigation. Just go to. So I'm using Xamarin Short Form Shell for everything. So if I look at this app, um, let me see, dot go to. What? There we go. So I basically have this from my view model. Tap on here. So I have this like go to async where I give it a page navigation and I just say go to shell and I track the page where the user is going and things like that. So pretty drop dead simple, just using Xamarin form shell, back navigation, things like that. So, and then each page opens up and creates its view model. So, yeah. Let's see. So Jay asks, would converting to .NET MAUI give UWP support? Um, I mean, it would in general, and we also give Mac support in the future too. Um, I could add a UWP head right now today. Um, I, I ship, you know, Xamarin, Xamarin forms, UWP apps. Um, the shell part of it just, it's not a, it's in preview for UWP Xamarin form shell. So it's not a hundred percent done, um, there, but I could technically could ship it out. Yeah. Cool. Once I was, I'll check out the video later. Yeah, you can scrub back in this video. You can literally do it right now. Scrub backwards. You'll be good to go. All right. Cool. Thanks for all the questions. I really appreciate it. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed the the the, the user group um, the session. Hope that you you know take a look at the app on the GitHub. Take a look at the video later. I mean, definitely. Sign up for the uh, .NET community standup. Uh, sorry, that I'm going to stand up. The .NET virtual user group, uh, which I talked about earlier, and of course you can find on Meetup.com uh, to find more upcoming stuff. But uh, I think that's going to do it. I think time investment. Good question. Um, good question. So Jay asks time investment. I spent maybe like a month and a half. I don't have my actual time time investment on it. As far as adding UWP support to it, depends if everything's supporting, um, maybe a few days, but then it's also like getting into the app store, doing other stuff, validating stuff, but all the, all the logic, these applications share 99% of code. I think I have like one custom run. No, I have, I have one render on iOS for borderless. I have 30 lines of code platform specific, specific so very minimal. Which is cool. Very uh, cool. Uh, Taz says it's great. Summit says it's great. 
Surface Duo and UWP have done at Maui. Yeah, totally, totally happening. So I can't wait for the Surface Duo actually, which is cool. Um, yeah, I think it's you know it's one lesson I learned is like, you know, create the apps and put them everywhere that you want them to be, and and you can always expand later too. You know what I mean? So. Cool, Jay, and enjoy the end. And yeah, it's real. It's totally an app. It's in the app store. I made money off of it. So it's cool. So Daniel says, great, it's virtual. Super cool. Awesome. Oh, that's a good idea. Just end the Skype call. All right. I think that's it. Well, thanks, everyone, for hanging out. You can follow me on Twitter, all the things. Um, John, you can, stop, so you can stop the Skype call whenever. I'm just going to leave silence here. How do we feel about that? I like that. I don't know if John can see me. That's cool. Go for it. Thanks everyone for tuning in and uh, have a good one. Bye.